Today, we are going to talk about WAC versus APB adjusted present value, the part two of this presentation. In a previous video, uh, we explained it was part two of uh, WAC versus APB, and this, in this video, we explain the assumptions behind both methods, WAC and APB. These assumptions determine the applicability of either approach for, for, uh, for depending on the circumstances, the case that we are uh, dealing with. Uh, in this presentation, we will uh, complete our previous discussion and uh, we will uh, reach a, a conclusion as to in which circumstances um, a WAC is the right method and uh, APB is the right method. First, remember the characteristics of APB. Under APB, the discount rate is unleveraged, reflecting the expected return demanded by investors from the type of business being analyzed. So we just discount uh, unlevered free cash flows after taxes at the um, after tax um, asset discount rate. Okay, the unlevered discount rate. So we don't need we don't need to adjust the discount rate depending on whether the cash flow is a perpetuity or not, as it is assumed uh, with WAC. Second, the firm as a whole is valued without consideration to the leverage of the firm over time. Remember that when we use WAC, uh, the WAC rate is, uh, has to be ad adapted depending on the uh, level of leverage of the firm uh, throughout the years. Here, leverage, under APB, leverage is treated as an independent variable with no relationship whatsoever with the value of the firm. Uh, so we just discount the unlevered uh, free cash flow and then we treat the impact of leverage apart. Uh, and the impact of leverage, of course, uh, the, the impact of leverage is the tax shield. How do we compute the tax shield? Well, we discount period by period tax savings. What we do is that we project the debt over the years. Then based on this, we calculate the tax savings coming from the debt. And then we discount this tax savings to calculate the present value of the tax shield. Well, the big advantage in this case is that we don't have necessarily to assume the same tax legislation for every country. The WAC, uh, the WAC uh, rule assumes that the only impact of debt on the value of the firm is through the corporate tax rate. Remember that the value of the tax yield was deemed the value of the debt multiplied by TC, the corporate tax rate. Well, uh, uh, when we deal uh, with cash flows in, for example, in many emerging markets, there are other factors that influence into the value of the tax shield, um, uh, which are different from the corporate tax rate or in addition to the corporate tax rate. Uh, so uh, in these cases, in principle, we, should, we couldn't apply the WAC rate. So we have to deal with adjusted present value. Well, this is uh, another of the advantages of AP, which is that we cannot adjust uh, the, the tax savings to the tax legislation of the country uh, we are dealing with. But having said this, are really WAC and APB equivalent? It seems that they are not. Okay, so let's let's see what is behind this, and we are going to illustrate this by uh, by by explaining two special or extreme cases. The first case is when the level of debt is completely independent of the value of the firm, and can be anticipated by management throughout the horizon. Of course, not a very realistic case. Okay, here we are assuming that uh, the, the level of the debt is completely predetermined by management over time. Well, in this extreme case, APB is the best method, of course, because the present value of the tax yield is added to the firm's unleveraged value and uh, is treated apart. The, the unlevered value of the firm, we know how to do it, is just the present value of the unlevered free cash flows after taxes, discounted at the at the raw rate, the rate corresponding to the uh, to the unlevered firm, and then uh, the present value of the tax yield is uh, uh, simply uh, calculated using the discount rate hold for the debt, because the only uh, determining factor of the tax yield is the cost of the debt, because the, the, the debt itself is determined by management. Case two is the case in which the firm seeks to maintain a stable debt ratio, which is the basic WAC case. Here, the level of the debt evolves with the value of the firm. So we know here that tax savings, the tax yield, uh, uh, are very complicated because uh, the tax yield on the one hand depends on the value of the firm and on the other hand depends on the cost of the debt. 
So the, the actual discount rate, uh, which is the, the, which would apply to the uh, tax savings, is not uh, determined. Uh, we really don't know which is uh, the right discount rate. There is only one case in which we know the rate, and that case is the case in which the cash flows are no growth perpetuities, which is the basic WAC case. Remember that when we have no growth perpetuities, the present value of the tax yield is given by this formula, okay, is equal to D, the value of the debt, multiplied by the corporate tax rate. But in every other case, the present value of the tax yield is undetermined under WAC because of this uh, situation in which you know we really don't know which are uh, which is the risk of the of the tax savings. Is it realistic to assume that the debt is completely independent from the value of the firm? Of course not, because uh, it is to be expected that the larger the larger the firm, the more debt the, the firm will have. Okay, so there there must be some relationship between the value of the firm and the value of the debt. So this uh, case one is unrealistic, as we said. From the start, is it realistic to value a firm as a no growth, no growth perpetuity? Well, of course not. It is very, very strange to have a firm whose cash flows are no growth perpetuities. Practically impossible. So this this case too is also is also uh, a, a case too in which we have a no growth perpetuity is also very unrealistic. How debt is determined in practice? Well, the widespread custom is to set up a mixed debt policy. First, a minimum relatively low debt ratio is established that should remain constant for the long term. And at the same time, there is like a caution, a second tier that is determined by management over time and is opportunistic in nature. You know, For instance, when uh, um, a company in an emerging market is expecting uh, a devaluation of the currency, you know, it's a good moment to take a lot of debt to import uh, raw materials, for instance. So the level of the debt, to a great extent, depends on what happens in the economy and how management plans to take advantage of this. In consequence, the debt is partially dependent on the value of the firm, because we have this minimum uh, debt uh, ratio that is a function of the value of the firm, and partially determined by management. Well, and the approach is quite the same in both unstable and stable markets. Only in stable markets, the second tier is less significant. You know, if, we, if you have a very stable market, say in Switzerland, okay, the surprises by government are very little, are very infrequent. So, you know, most of the debt is determined by the value of the firm. You have more or less a stable debt ratio uh, over time. And this is, by the way, what is assumed in most uh, corporate uh, finance uh, textbooks, which are focused on big, uh, stable companies in uh, stable markets. But uh, uh, if we look at the way that is really established in practice in most com companies all over the world, uh, then we have a problem both for the APB and for the WAC, uh, given that the discount rate for the tax yield is not clearly defined okay, when we have, um, when we have uh, uh, the debt determined in this, uh, in this way. Uh, for a uh, Professor Fernandez from ESS a few years back uh, proposed um, what I, we call here the two cash flow approach that I, I believe that solved this problem. He says that the difficulty in selecting a correct, dis correct, a correct discount rate for the tax yield stems from the fact that the value of the tax yield is not actually the discounted uh, cash flow, uh, the discounted value of one cash flow. He says that the, the tax yield, the present value of the tax yield, is actually the difference in present values of two cash flows of different risk. He says that uh, first, you have the present value of the uh, taxes paid by the levered firm, and then you have the present value of the taxes paid by the unlevered firm. And the present value of the tax yield is just the difference between the taxes paid under these two scenarios. So the tax flows, the taxes paid, by the unlevered firm are discounted to present value using the unlevered discount rate for the firm, which we call rho. And the tax flows or the tax payments by the levered firm are discounted uh, using the discount rate on equity, RE, which in the case we have uh, not a constant leverage ratio, RE will have to be adjusted year uh, after year, depending on the changing leverage ratio. 
by, by following this procedure, the APD method uh, will yield the right result in every case. So we can apply APD always. Uh, whereas a WAC, as we said before, is only applicable in the case in which we have uh, no growth perpetuities because of this problem with the discard rate of the tax shield. Let's illustrate with an example the, this uh, two cash flow approach. Imagine that we have a, a company, okay, and this is the data. Uh, the corporate tax rate is 30%. The discount rate on equity, RE, we are assuming to be constant at 20%, and a non levered discount rate rho of 15%. And here we have, in this bottom table, we have the uh, pro, uh, pro forma uh, balance sheets, in which we have you know, all the items of the pro forma balance sheet for the, say, the next three years. So how do we calculate uh, the tax yield? First, let's start with leverage taxes. Leverage taxes is this first table here. We know that leverage taxes, just taking it from the table, are 20, 25, 50, 24, and 50 to 50 during these next three years. And this comes from the pro forma balance sheets. And then we discount this to present value by using the uh, discount rate on equity, which we assume constant, and we obtain a present value for the Lever taxes a present value of 68.30. Now let's go, let's proceed with the unlevered taxes. Unlevered taxes, we just start with EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes, 100, 100, and 200, that we take from the pro forma balance sheets. And then we apply to EBIT, we apply the corporate tax rate of 30%. So unlevered taxes will be 30, 30, and 60 over the next three years. Now we calculate the present value of these unlevered taxes using rho, the discount rate, the unlevered discount rate, and we obtain a present value of 88.22. Then the present value of the tax yield will be just the difference between these two percent values, 88.22 minus 68.30, or a value of 19.92. Now let's contrast this two cash flow method with perpetuities. Well, Fernandez proves that under the two cash flow approach, in the case of a no growth perpetuity, which is the basic WAC case, the present value of the tax yield equals precisely D, the value of the debt, multiplied by the corporate tax rate, which is exactly the same result we obtain under WAC. So if you calculate the present value of the tax yield, you see what you get, uh, you know, the present value of the tax yield will be equal to DTC. If you use the two cash flow approach, you get exactly the same value, okay, but only when you have no growth uh, perpetuities. He also shows that under the two cash flow method, the present value of the tax yield of a growing perpetuity is given by this formula down here. This is uh, interesting because uh, remember that uh, generally for the terminal value, we assume a growing perpetuity. So if we want to apply the adjusted present value method to find the present value of this terminal value, we can do it. We just first find the present value of the unlevered free cash flows of the perpetuity using the unlevered discount rate rho, and then we add the present value of the tax yield of this growing perpetuity by using this formula. And notice that the present value of the tax yield is just this expression here, is the value of the debt at time n plus one, n plus one uh, N plus one is the first year after the horizon, the projection horizon, multiplied by TC, which is the corporate tax rate, and also multiplied by rho, divided by rho minus G. Rho is the unlevered after tax discount rate, and G is the nominal growth rate. So what we can conclude here. First, WAC is only valid to discount the tax yield where the cash flows are no growth perpetuities, which is, of course, an unrealistic case. APD is valid in every case, always, as long as the tax yield is discounted, is discounted following the two cash flow approach that we explained before. So in conclusion, APD together with the two, two cash flow approach is the right way to discount a company's uh, free cash flows. And this is uh, everything we wanted to share with you today.